Hallelujah. Well, welcome to Gleaning in the Word this Friday. I have to be honest with you, I had a very stressful afternoon trying to set up an iPad for my grandson, which I apparently have really messed up. But anyway, uh, I, I want to continue to teach on the Holy Spirit. This will be part uh, seven, I believe, because you cannot really exhaust the the uh, the uh, the exper the knowledge of learning the Holy Spirit. There, many men have have talked about him over the ages, but but just a few quotes I'd like to share with you this morning. But let us first let us start to pr let us start with prayer. Father, we're grateful to be in your house today. We're grateful to be in your presence. And Father, we acknowledge you, God, that we cannot do this without your Holy Spirit. Father, we want to know you in a greater way. We want to know how the Spirit works and what he does in our life, God. And Father, so we rely totally on you, God, to teach this word to us, Father, to speak to our hearts, God. Open our eyes and our ears that we can hear and see what you have to say. We ask this all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, A.W. Tozer, one of my most favorite gospel writers, uh, said this, Wise leaders should have known that the human heart cannot exist in a vacuum. If Christians are forbidden to enjoy the wine of the Spirit, they will turn to the wine of flesh. Christ died for our hearts, and the Holy Spirit wants to come and satisfy them. There's others, uh, Charles Spurgeon, maybe many of you might have heard of him. He's an old time Bible scholar. But he said this, a church and a lamb without the spirit is rather a curse than a blessing. If you have not the spirit of God, Christian worker, remember that you stand in somebody else's way. You are a fruitless tree standing where a fruitful tree might grow. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? Uh, we have been talking about the symbols of the Spirit, and we, we talked about the anointing of the Holy Spirit uh, last uh, week, and we talked about that anointing that flows down through us, and we're anointed as priests and kings unto the Lord. That's according to Revelation 1, 6 and 5, 10. But it tells us this, that as we think about the king, he rules, and he has, he rules, and so, Brother and sister, we're to rule this flesh. We're to, uh, Paul said that I die daily. I bring this flesh into subjection. And so we're to put off and to put on. We're to put off all the works of the flesh and put on the fruit of the spirit. Now, a high priest also acts as he, he, uh, he gives, uh, he gives offerings. Uh, he receives the offering to give it to the Lord. And he, and he gives praise, and we talked extensively about praise, and we've even shared this in the church, our church service here at Present True Fellowship Church, because I really felt like this was very important for us to understand who we are in Christ and what our, our duties are as a, as a king and a priest under the Lord. And now, that priest, they were ordered to offer up praise. Even uh, one of them says that we offer up the sacrifice of praise because sometimes it's not easy to praise God, just like it was for me today. It was not, I had a very stressful time and, and it was not easy. Uh, I, even, I, I wish I hadn't come down, but I know better than that. I know I have to obey the Spirit of God. And so sometimes it is a sacrifice, and 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 we in our giving, we uh, not only when we say giving people all they all they talk about is money. I, I'm not talking about money. Money is part of it. Don't get me wrong. I believe that we are to give give unto the Lord, and and. Uh, uh, so I, I'm not going to argue about tithe or what you're supposed to give, but you give uh, what you feel like you should give, and and hopefully that's what the Lord wants. And so uh, we give, and, but all, not only of our money, but our time. And, and I heard one uh, man said that God wants ten percent of our time, which is two hours and forty minutes. But I really believe God wants all of our time. 
not two hours and 40 minutes, that we're to give ourselves continually to him. Even David said, I, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise should continually be in my mouth. If you look for that word continually in the scriptures, you'll see how God has used that word. He wants us to be continually with him. Uh, we don't give God two hours and 40 minutes. We give him all our life. He, he died for all of our time. He didn't die for two hours and 40 minutes. Come on, brother and sister, think about that. That doesn't even really make sense, does it really? And so uh, we are, uh, we, uh, we are to, uh, mm, how do I say this? Uh, so we, we give him, we give him of our money, we give of our time, and our time can be many ways. Uh, it, it, it can be time in prayer, time about witnessing, time about studying his word, uh, or time about coming to church and being faithful to the house of God. Oh, I know that's a, not a pleasant subject today. A lot of people will, uh, the building, that's just a building. That is true. It is just a building. But God does meet us in this building, God. His presence does fill the sanctuary every Sunday. When we gather together, we feel the presence of the Almighty God. He has spoke to us through His, His Word. He spoke to us through uh, tongues and interpretations. He spoke to us even in praise. And so we come together as a body of believers, and we all realize we all have a function. Now, I, I, I don't want to, I'm getting off a little bit, but I think this. That we, uh, there's so many churches in this city of St. Joseph. There really is. Uh, if you don't like what one does, I'm sure you can find one. But I, I think this, why do we not ask the Lord? Because yeah. the Bible says that he set us in the body as it pleased him. And I'm, I'm not going to argue with you about this. I'm not going to argue with you about this, that God does set us in a place where it pleases him. And why does he set us in a place? Because it's in that place we find our fulfillment. That as we function in that place that God has set us, we find fulfillment in that place. And so I really, really encourage you to really pray about where you go. I don't I know everybody don't belong here. Couldn't have everybody here. This church only holds maybe 100 people, and that'd be very crowded. But we are grateful for the people that we have here, and we love every one of them. And we're building a church out of relationships, loving God, loving one another, and loving those outside of us because we want people to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. We want to know, we want them to, as a psalmist said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He is so good to us. He's a good God. Uh, that's his very nature, goodness. It's a father's good pleasure to give us gifts. Amen. And, and I, I'm not a prosperity preacher or any of that, but I know my God loves me and he wants to bless me. And so I appreciate what he does for me. Now, I want to finish up on the anointing. See, the Lord also wants to anoint those who have been overcome by the spirit of mourning with the oil of rejoicing. That anointing brings the lifting of our heads with the refreshing of seeing beyond today. Uh, see, sometimes the, the, the things get so pressured on us. We, become, we begin to mourn over the things in our life and it becomes such a pressure that we can't see beyond today. We only see what's right in front of us. We can't see what tomorrow holds and, and so, uh, it's not with the superficial optimism. This is not a psych you out thing, you know. This is something genuine that the Holy Spirit does. But but it's with a deep abiding of hope that has been got, begotten in us by the Spirit of God, by that anointing that flows down through us. Now, if you were with me, we've read some of these scriptures, but I'd like to go back over them just for a few minutes. Isaiah 51, 11, that's in Isaiah 51, uh, verse 11, and it says this, Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord, are you redeemed today? Do you know him? as your Savior? Have you confessed your sins? Have you received him into your life? Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with what? With singing unto Zion and everlasting joy 
shall be upon their head, and they shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow, and mourning shall flee away. Do you hear that? Mourning shall flee away. Now, can we, if you'll give me, uh, let's go to Isaiah 61, verse 3. Isaiah 61, verse 3. Uh, and this is one of my uh, most favorite scriptures. He says this, uh, verse 3. He says, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, to give unto, uh, ashes the oil of joy for the mourning, and the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Wow, what a powerful scripture to the church. Amen excuse me, to appoint unto them. You know what that word appoint means? It means to set as a permanent, irrevocable thing. God has placed uh, a revocable thing under that morning to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for, the, for mourning. Come on, do you not see uh, the uh, antidote for mourning is joy? Sometimes we get so grieved in our spirit, so pressed down that we cannot see beyond the situation in our life. Uh, it, I don't know if, you, or if you're familiar with your Bible, but I would hope you would be. But in the book of Esther, it tells this story about Esther. Uh, she was a Jewish uh, princess, and uh, her uncle's name was Mordecai. And anyway, if you read that whole story, I don't want to re go into the whole thing, but listen to this, to this. Let, go to Esther. Uh, let's go to Esther 4 uh, and go to 4 and go to 1 through 3. We're going to read 1 through 3. Now listen to what it says. When Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes, put on slack cloth with ashes, and went out in the midst of the city and crowd, cried with a loud voice and a bitter cry. And it came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And every province, province wherever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was a great mourning among the Jews, fasting and weeping and wailing, and many laid in the sackcloth and ashes. And the reason this was happening was that there was a wicked man named Haman. And Haman had gotten the king to uh, decree, make a decree that all those who were Jews were to be put to death. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, see, everybody thought Hitler was first. No, Hitler's in a long line of those who have tried to wipe out the bloodline of Christ. Amen. And so, uh, anyway, uh, when when Mordecai heard this news, it grieved him. You would not would you not be grieved if you known that your family, your children, your your brothers, your sisters, everybody you knew was going to be uh, murdered in the morning. Yeah. And so he he began to cry out and weep. It brought a spirit of mourning upon him, not only him, but the Jews all over through the kingdom of Babylon, because this is where, the, uh, well, this was in the medial Persia. I'm sorry, this was in the medial Persia time. And all through the kingdom, this decree had been made. And so uh, he began to cry out to God and, and weep before him. Now, if you'll turn with me to stay in Esther, but let's go to chapter 8, and let's look at verse 15 of 8, 8, 15 of Esther. Listen to what it says. And Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white and with a great crown of gold, with a garment of fine linen and purple, and the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. Verse 16 said, The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. Sometimes when we had that spirit of mourning, we begin to cry out to God, God hears our cry. And he begins to change that situation. What looked like death for them became life for them. And what Haman had proposed for them, Haman was hanged on a gallows. That's what he wanted to do to Mordecai. Mordecai would not bow down to him. It made him so upset. He was such a prideful man. 
And so, brother and sister, we struggle with all this. And but here, here it is. God changes, turns the tan tables, and and you know what God did? He made Haman. <laughs> This is, uh, this really is, he made Haman put Mordecai on a hot horse and prayed him through the city. And I can't remember what he made him say. But anyway, what he wanted done to him, God done to Mordecai. I'm telling you, that's the way God works. Haman eventually lost his life because of the way he felt toward the Jews. There's always been an animosity toward Jews by lots of people in this world. Now, let's go to Hebrew. I know, let's not go to Hebrew. Let's go to Esther 9, verse 22. That's Esther 9, verse 22. And he says this in 22. He says, and the days wherein the Jews rested from their enemies, and the month which was turned into them from sorrow to joy, from sorrow to joy, and from mourning into a good day, that they should make them days of feasting and joy and sending portions one to another, gifts to the... I tell you what, we've, we've got to begin to rejoice in him, knowing that whatever is happening in our life, God will make turn it around for our good. That's his promise to us. And we stand on those promises, and we believe God and trust him for those things. Because God's greatest desire is to bless us. Ah, oh, man, why can't we not taste and see that the Lord is good? Amen. Now, isn't that a wonderful story of God, how he turned things around? Listen to what it says in Psalms, Psalms uh, 30, uh, verse 11. Now, we're, we're still talking about the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Psalms 30, uh, verse 11 says this, and he, and he said this, Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing, and thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. Hallelujah. You know what that uh, turn means? It means to uh, change. It means to overturn, to overthrow, to retire, to set aside. Come on. What has God done? He has set aside. He has overturned. He's overthrown our mourning and, and, and to uh, dancing. And thou hast put off sackcloth. And so the antidote really uh, for this is that I have something I read and I would like to share with you, and it's something on the same vein as we're talking about. Uh, this pastor shared this. The enemy has attacked the body of Christ with a spirit of mourning, a spirit of grief can gain an inroad, not just after the death of a loved one, but also from a series of disappointments. We can mourn over the disappointments in our life. Uh, uh, our heart has been broken repeatedly. It will cause mourning in our life. The death of a dream from life taking an unexpected direction. Have you ever had your life take an unexpected direction? Someone you loved and cared about all of a sudden was gone? Well, that's a, that's a direction. Or you lost a job that you thought you would have for the rest of your life. There's a change of direction, unexpected direction. A shattered relationship can bring a spirit of mourning. Your heart being battered and bruised from repeated attacks from the enemy. Anguish over long-term problems health problems that seems like they last forever, financial problems that seems like they last forever, relationship problems that seem like they are. There's a myriad of other discouraging, devastating, damaging life events. The enemy is attacked with a spirit of grief and a spirit of mourning in order to take the fight out of us. He wants us to be in mourning. He wants us to grieve over what's going on in our life so that we don't have no fight left. You know, sometimes you, you just mourn, you just you give up. I've seen people who have lost their, their wife or their husband, and they just they mourn over the loss of them, and they just kind of give up. You know, and that's what he wants us to do is to give up. But the anointing of the Holy Spirit is in it, and he wants us, he begins to speak to us, and he says, rejoice. And you're saying, what? Rejoice? I don't feel like rejoicing. I feel like crying. I feel like weeping. I feel like uh, shutting myself off in a room and not talking to anybody. Uh, 
That's what the enemy wants to do is close us off from everything. But God says, I want you to rejoice. I want you to come out of that. I want you to rejoice. I've given you the spirit of rejoicing for the spirit of heaviness. Come on. And so what we have to do, we have to begin to fight. If this is you, you get along with God today and you bind that spirit of grief or mourning, commanding to loose its hold from you. Tell it right now. We bind it in the name of Jesus. Loose your hold on their lives. They're, God is a great God, and he's able to deliver you from that. Ask the Lord to reach his healing hand into your spiritual heart and perform spiritual heart surgery, healing open wounds, soothing open scar tissues, softening the hardening, hardened places of your heart, tearing down walls that you built to protect yourself from future hurts, and extracting any bitterness that is in your heart. Because, brothers and sisters, sometimes we've been hurt so many times we build walls and we won't let nobody get in to us because, not because we don't want that, but we're afraid of being hurt. We, we want fellowship, but at the same time, we're afraid they're going to hurt us like others have hurt us. That's part of life. I wish it wasn't. I wish that everybody could love one another and get along with one another, but it just doesn't work like that. But there's an anointing here, anointing of the Holy Spirit. Help us, God, to get along. And then ask God to restore the joy of your salvation and give you joy unspeakable. He heals the broken heart and, heart and binds up their rooms. That's what it says in Psalm 147 and in so many words. And so I thought that was a great thing there. God wants to uh, do some great things in our lives. And brothers and sisters, the Word of God is the most powerful thing there is. And so we come with this teaching on the Holy Spirit. I believe it's so. Now, let me talk about number seven, and it's called the water of the Spirit. Amen. A hallelujah. Uh, I, I have uh, some notes that I would like to go over with you. That, that the seventh symbol is the water of the Spirit. If you have your Bibles, if you would turn in your word to John 7, 37 and 39. John 7, uh, 37 and 39. And he says this, On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whose those, who, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because, excuse me, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So these verses clarify that the Bible uses water as a figure of the Holy Spirit, both in terms of its cleansing properties and a source of power. Could Jesus be using water in this way in John 3, 5? Turn with me to John 3, 5. Let's look at that verse, uh, John 3, 5. Hallelujah. It, I'll tell you, God is so good. I love him so much. And Jesus answered... Verily, very I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Does sound like that's what he was talking about, man being born of water and the Spirit. Now, come on, the Bible frequently mentions the Word of God in conjunction with birth and life. In Psalms 119, 50 reads this, this is my comfort in my afflictions, so for your word has given me life. And then over in 1 Corinthians 4.15, for though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. The gospel is composed of words. We are instructed in James 1.18 of his own will. He brought us forth by the word of God. So the presence of the Holy Spirit brings life. His nearness is refreshing and restores the vitality of your soul. Because the water flows from the Spirit within, you never have to worry about emptying your source. Now, this really 
ties all together, really. If you remember last week when we talked about the two olive trees by the candlestick, it was a continual flow of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. They didn't have to fill the lampstand. It continually draw from the trees itself. And so, brother and sister, God wants a, a continual refresh. The Holy Spirit will continually refreshes us every day. Have you ever been so hot and somebody give you a cold drink of water and how refreshing that was, was and it kind of revived you? Come on. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Sometimes we get we get dry and thirsty and 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 and. and uh, we get dry in our religious experiences sometimes. Sometimes we just go through the emotions of doing what God wants us to do, but there's no flowing. It become, it, it starts coming from here instead of from here because uh, the heart is where God deals with. That's where he wants things to come from. Because he tells us, uh, he said, uh, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. With all thy heart, come on, all thy soul, all thy mind, all thy strength. God wants us to be totally enveloped in this. So the presence of the Holy Spirit brings life. His nearness is refreshing, restores the vitality of our soul because the water flows from your spirit. And you never have to worry about emptying your soul. You cannot exhaust the supply of the Holy Spirit. He has enough for every person upon this earth. Wherever that river and rain of the Holy Spirit touch, there is life. Think about this for just a second. This is really kind of exciting to me. Uh, how do I, you know, if you take a, a desert area and you begin to water it, life will begin to flow out of that because even in barrenness, because, listen, we all come to God barren. We're all dry and thirsty. We all need to take a drink of that well of water and and that refreshes us and revives us. Come on, we're all in that place. We all need life to come into us. And the Holy Spirit is continual supply of life. Listen to what he says in John 4, 4 13 through 14. Listen, Jesus replied, Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But who drinks it, the water I will give, will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Uh, that's another verse. Uh, uh, let me read it out of the King James. I, I don't know why he put that scripture in. I'm not a fan of anything but much, much of the King James most of the time. Because so many versions uh, take some things away from the word of God. But listen, Jesus answered and said unto that, her, this is the woman at the well. This is the woman who had been uh, with five different men. Uh, and he says, and he said unto her, who is ever drinketh this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Springing up. Come on. I remember as I was a kid, uh, I, used to live, I lived in Kansas City and we lived in a project area. I used to ride my bike for miles, but there was this place in this little parkway, and there was this spring that came up out of the ground, and, and, and the water was so cool and tasted so sweet. Amen. And it never, it always flowed. I suppose it's still flowing. But you know what? That that it means to leap, to gush up. That that would. Have you ever just been in a service and you felt something? coming up out of you that's the holy spirit he's he's bringing the water of life to you hallelujah and so yeah and when he talks to this woman he says that he is the water water represents the holy spirit's ability to refresh us quench our spiritual thirst cleanse us and bring forth life wherever he flows he is the rain of heaven and he is the living river that flows from within water can be symbolic for the holy spirit spirit now uh, that, that so water it, it, it speaks of life 
And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He brings life. The Bible says he quickens us. And that, we, that word means to be made alive. And so when you're, uh, when you're thirsty and dry, you need to drink of the Holy Spirit because he wants to quicken you. He wants to make you alive. Now, the eighth re- thing I, ta- I want to talk about and, uh, is the dove. Uh, uh, we've seen the Holy Spirit as a dove. In fact, the dove is the only thing we've ever seen the form that they describe the Holy Spirit, the dove. Uh, I, listen to what he says in Luke 3.22. Luke 3.22. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke 3.22. Twenty-two. That's right after Mark, right before John, three, twenty-two, and the Holy Ghost descended into a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, "Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased." What does the Holy Spirit look like? We're to given. We are given a description of Jesus and the Father, but rarely. Do we see a description of the Holy Spirit? Today, his body is your body. But the Holy Spirit appeared in physical form in the gospel. Yes, the Bible gives a physical description of the Holy Spirit. The gospels each record this this spectacular event in the life of Christ. Although they will often vary in the way they describe that event, They do not ever contradict one another. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John each describe the event of Jesus' baptism in the same way. During the baptism of Jesus, the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove. This agreement upon the way they described the Holy Spirit indicates to me that what they saw was a little description and not a figurative description. Those who witnessed the heavenly display literally saw the Holy Spirit in the shape and likeness of a dove descend upon Jesus. Listen to what he says in Matthew 3.16. We, we read in Luke, but the, and after his baptism, as Jesus came out of the water, heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. And then listen to what he says in Mark 1.10. And Jesus came up out of the water. He saw heaven splitting apart and Holy Spirit descending upon him like a dove. That was Mark 1.10. Then John testified in John 1.32. Uh, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. Luke's gospel confirms the literal way which the Holy Spirit became upon Jesus. He makes it clear that the Holy Spirit took the form of a dove. Other scriptures in the Bible symbolically speak to the pure, innocent, and undefiled nature of the Holy Spirit. Song of Solomon uh, Chapter 5, verse 2 reads this way. I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with dew, and my lock with the drops of the night. That's the song of Psalm, my dove. He's inviting the Holy Spirit. Listen about a dove. A dove is seen in the account of Noah in the ark. Noah wanted to see if there was a dry ground, so he went out. He sent out a dove from the ark, and the dove came back with an olive branch. Since that time, the olive branch has been the symbol of peace. Symbolically, the olive branch tells us God has declared peace. The dove, the spirit, represented bringing the good news of reconciliation of God and man, of course. This was only temporal because lasting spiritual reconciliation comes through the true olive branch, Jesus Christ. We have peace with God through him. He is the true olive branch. He is the true dove that brings peace. So like the dove, the Holy Spirit is what? Elegant. He's pure. He's gentle. And such as the dove can be symbolic for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will not force himself on you. 
Now, people, I, there's arguments about the Holy Spirit. I believe everybody has the Spirit. You cannot be saved without the Spirit. So, whether you believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what we most Pentecostals believe today, is that there's a second experience with Him. We're saved by Him, and then we're baptized in that Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Another controversial thing in the church today, and has been for years, the speaking in tongues. I'm not going to talk a lot about that right now. We will get into that area of the Holy Spirit, but I, I do want just to show you that He, uh, tell you, I guess, not show you, but tell you that uh, the Holy Spirit wants to, uh, to over, how do I want to say that? Well, the scripture says this, I have been bought with a price, I am not my own. What? No, you're not. Your, Bible, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So therefore, he possesses this body. It's, uh, this body becomes his temple. Amen. And, uh, and so, I like what he said in the song. If I can read that all, that scripture just yelling out to me, Song of Solomon 5.2. I sleep, but my heart waketh. Excuse me. Is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. For my head is filled with dew, and my lock with the drops of the night. What a powerful word. Now, Let's go on. We talked about, we finish up the anointing. We, we talked about uh, the water and now the dove. Let's talk about the ninth symbol and the breath. Now, Job 33, 4. Job 33, 4. If you want to turn your Bibles with me, Job 33, 4. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty has given me life. Wow. The Spirit of God has made me. And the breath of the Almighty has given me life. The Holy Spirit is the breath of God. He is the breath of light that sustains all living beings. And the word, listen to what it says in Genesis 2 7, 2 7 of Genesis. And the Lord formed man of the dust of ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. The Spirit of God was breathed into us. Listen to what he says in Job 33, 4. Job 33, 4. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty has what? given me life. Wow. So the Holy Spirit proceeds from the depths of God. That is why when imparting the Holy Spirit to follow Jesus, breathed upon them. Listen to what he says in John 20, 22. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Wow. What, what a wonderful thing. The Holy Spirit is unpredictable, invisible, but powerful. He brings refreshing, he stirs the atmosphere, and brings life. He is the wind of heaven, the breath of God. Now, Paul writing to Timothy said, For all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And I'm not going to quote the whole thing, but he says, All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. You know what inspiration means? God breathed. The Holy Spirit was the one who inspired men to write. Now, people argue about the Bible. I usually have one here with me, I'm sorry. But, I but people argue about the Bible. Uh, this is the Word of God. This is what. We've been handed down from centuries, from centuries, and, and we have to trust in something. We have to trust that this is the absolute truth, amen? Because if we have no absolute truth, then we live in chaos. And so we need absolute truth. And our nation has suffered because we've departed from the truth. Because you know what the Bible says about the truth? That the truth will set you free. 
And so many of us are bound up by our flesh and by our desires and by our own self-interest that we have no absolutes in our lives anymore. We, whatever feels right, we do. Now, I love the Word of God. It's one of the most powerful things in my life. And, and so when I read the Word of God, really the Holy Spirit is breathing life into me. If I could do you, urge you to do anything, just to read one chapter a day, it wouldn't take you five minutes to read a chapter a day. And I'm going to tell you, you would see a change in your life. You just read one chapter, and you read it openly. You let the Spirit of God speak to you through that chapter. You know, He could even speak to you through Leviticus, and, and some people, that's one of the most boring books of the Bible. You know, I've got excited over Leviticus because the Spirit of God began to breathe life into me through that word. That's something I needed to hear. Now listen, we talked about this. We're really going pretty good today. We're going to talk about the tenth thing, the seal of God. And we find that in Ephesians 4, 20. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians 4, 20. We're talking about the Holy Spirit as a seal. Uh, Four, verse 20. But you have not... Oh, I must have the wrong scripture here. That's why I got it crossed out. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay, go to, to Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. That's where I want to go. I'm sorry. Not Ephesians 4, 20, but Ephesians 4, 1, 13 through 14. In whom, also, in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, whom also after you believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance till the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of the glory. The seal represents the certainty that we receive the Holy Spirit. Despite what our emotions tell us, despite what lies the enemy tells us, despite what our own human reasoning tells us, we know that we belong to be God to God because of the Holy Spirit. The seal of the promise of salvation, the seal of the Holy Spirit is God fear, God's fear de defeating peace giving promise to us, the assurance of our own salvation, the seal can be symbolic of the Holy Spirit. We've gotten through the ten seals, uh, tenth one here, the seal, the symbol of the Holy Spirit we've been talking about. Now, I, I don't want to, uh, uh, I don't know if you know, and sometimes when they use these words, they, they're, they're uh, describing something that they knew in their time what the seal was. Now, in the ancient Bible times when they would have a document and they, and they would, uh, we, they would seal that document, and, and they tell us they put wax on it, then the king would put his ring on there, and it, would make, it was sealed by the king, and it wouldn't be open to only to those who it would be open to. And so the Holy Spirit has sealed us. Uh, uh, go back to Ephesians 1. Uh, I mean, let's go to Ephesians 1. I want to read a scripture again because I don't want us to... Go over this slightly. Ephesians 1, 13. And whom so also you have trusted that after you heard the word of truth, you, you trusted it, you've trusted the word of God, you heard the word of truth, amen. Uh, I, 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 can I just share something with you right now? Is this, that there's a, there was an old time gospel writer, I've read several of his books, his name was Derek Prince. And what Derek Prince was, he was a scholar. And so he, he began to study every major philosophy of life, Hinduism and Confucius and, and the Muslim and, and, and all the other. I mean, he studied them all. And then he comes to Christianity and he began to read the Bible. And he said it was the only book that made him feel bad because this book is alive and it will speak to you. Now listen, he says, you've trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your what? Salvation, in whom also that after you believe, you were, after you believed, after you heard the truth, after you trusted it, after you heard the gospel, then you were sealed, sealed, 
It means to stamp with a signa. It means to, it, to keep a secret, to attest, to stop, to seal. It means uh, to mark a person. Now, we as Christians, we have a, we're a little leery of being marked. Amen. And uh, but he says this: after you were sealed with that Holy Spirit, we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. God has set his signa on us. He's set his mark upon us. And that mark is the Holy Spirit. It's what separates us. See, the Holy Spirit does so much in our lives. And we need that sealing of the Holy Spirit. We are just flying along today. I tell you, we're getting some places today. Now, we're going to talk about another area I don't really want to argue with anybody about. Whether you believe in oneness and uh, or you believe in the Trinity or you believe in two, there's so many different beliefs out there today. But I want to talk about the deity of the Holy Spirit, Spirit of our God. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to First Corinthians chapter six, verse eleven. First Corinthians chapter six, verse eleven. First Corinthians six, eleven. And such were some of you, but you, but ye are worse, but you are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. The influence of the Holy Spirit begins way before you accept God. I believe the work of regeneration started way back in our lives. I can look back at my life and I can see how God dealt with me in different ways and how he kept me. He was at work in my life long before I accepted Jesus as my Savior. Till I come to that point when I came to that little church at and here in St. Joe Wood, and I, I, I can't tell you the date, I can't tell you what the preacher preached, but I know what the Holy Spirit, I felt such a conviction over the sin of my life. The influence of the Holy Spirit was bringing that conviction upon me, and I had to get to that altar to repent. Now, you don't have to be in church to get saved. Don't get me wrong. You can get saved on a street corner. You can get saved in a, in a grocery store, Walmart. You can get saved in your home, in your car. The Holy Spirit is not limited what he does. and He brings conviction. Sometimes it's because of something that happens in our life. And so the influence of the Holy Spirit starts way before we accept God as our Savior, before we confess our sin. He brings us to that point where we, have, we realize we must confess our sins to receive forgiveness from them. If there's no confessing of sin, there's no forgiveness of sin. Amen. And so the influence of the Holy Spirit and by the Spirit of our God, think of a man who having fallen overboard is carried away by the current. At last, a rope is flung towards him. He eagerly grasps it, and he is thereby rescued. We have here a combination of causes. The kind friend who threw the rope, the rope itself, and the man's own eager grasp. Thus, the Savior merits the penitent faith, penitent's faith, the sinner's faith, and the influence of the Spirit are necessary to rescue Necessary to secure the salvation of the soul. It means it. It means this. In the name of our Lord, nothing but that has sufficient power to change the heart. The agency, and by the Holy Spirit of our God, is it is He that gives us effect to words. Well, I'm having trouble reading this. Uh, I, uh, the agency, and by the Spirit of our God. It is he that gives effect to the word preached, moves in the heart, destroys the yoke of sin, and creates a man, a new creature in Christ Jesus. He is the deity of the Holy Spirit. He is a God. He is God. Just like God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Just as 
deity speaks of God, of a Godhead, and, and so he is part of the Godhead. Let, let, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 6, 11, we remind us of what he said. And such for some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of God. He said, some of you are washed, but you are sanctified. Sanctified means to be set apart. Now, the work of sanctification is an ongoing process that begins when you knelt at that altar. Actually, re regeneration, sanctification, uh, means this, that God is regenerating. He's bringing light to us. He's trying to bring us out of death into life. And then when we realize that and the Holy Spirit begins to sanctify us, he sets us apart. But he does something else. There's a work of justification. And this is what this means. When we accepted him, as our, when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, uh, there's something happened. Really, two things happened. Three things have really been operating. Regeneration, sanctification, and justification. But we can't be sanctified unless we're justified. So justification has to start first. And justification literally means this, that he took the penalty of our sin. He declared us to God not guilty. That's what he did when he hung on that cross. He took the penalty of our sin. He justified us. And there could be no justification unless there was a sacrifice made. And that sacrifice was the precious eternal Lamb of God, the Son of God. And he sacrificed himself upon that cross. No man took his life. He gave his life willingly. So the Spirit of God is involved in all of this. The Spirit of God has always been. Do you understand that? It says over in Genesis that the Spirit, of the Spirit moved across the face of the waters. Come on. The Holy Spirit has been involved all through. You'll see him all through the Scriptures. And David said, take not thy Spirit, for thy Holy Spirit from me. Come on. Uh, he has always been involved in history. And you realize this, that Jesus didn't come come into his ministry. He didn't start his ministry until he received the Holy Spirit. It says when he was baptized, we talked about the scripture just about the dove who descended the Holy Spirit, and it said he was led into the wilderness by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because he needed the Holy Spirit just like we need the Holy Spirit. So the influence of the Holy Spirit started way back in your life. Probably when you didn't even realize it, you didn't even think about it, it was happening. God was doing something in your life. It was bringing, you begin to think about, I shouldn't be doing this. I, I shouldn't be mean like that. I shouldn't hate like that. I shouldn't resent people like that. I shouldn't be dishonest. I, uh, you, that's the influence of the Spirit. He's beginning to, to deal, with the, deal with you and he's beginning to talk to you and he's trying to draw you to God. So, the deity of the Holy Spirit, he's the Spirit of our God. He come from God. And he's also the Spirit of Christ. Listen to what it says in Romans 8, 9. But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man had not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Who is the Spirit of Christ? He's the Holy Spirit. Remember what Jesus said? I must go that I may send another comforter to you. Jesus was the comforter. He sent another comforter, but he had to leave for him to come because the Holy Spirit is given to each believer when they are born again. Every Christian has within themselves a principle higher and more powerful than the flesh. While that is very good, we need to hear that over and over again. That what's in us, he that he that is in us is greater, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. 
Amen, brother and sister. We do fight this flesh constantly. We have that propensity to fall back into sin, but we're delivered. With the dominion of sin has been broken in our life. That sin nature that used to rule us has no more power over us because the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, has entered into his temple and he's cleaning his house and washing it clean and making it fit for the master to come into the house. Amen. Man, he's a cleaner. He's that cleaner. He does it for me all the time. He always talking to me, always telling me, you need to stop doing that, stop saying that. I, upstairs, I'm getting so angry. I know my wife was upset. I was upset, but uh, please forgive me. I, I, I tell you, I don't want to get like that. So we have to begin to listen to the Spirit of God. He is the Spirit of Christ. Many sincere people are yet spiritually under John the Baptist's ministry of repentance. Their state is practically that of the struggle of Romans 7, where neither Christ nor the Holy Spirit is mentioned, but only a quickened, but an undelivered soul in a struggle under a sense of duty, not a sense of full acceptance in Christ and sealing by the Word of God. And that's written by David, uh, by a man named Newell. Do you understand what he's talking about? There's a struggle. uh, When he talks about John the Baptist's ministry, John preached repentance, and that's as far as his ministry went. And I can remember in the book of Acts, it talks about this. uh, They asked him if they'd been baptized in the Holy Spirit, but their only experience was that baptism of, of repentance and John uh, uh, Paul I, I, or Peter whichever one I, I'm not for sure and they said well you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit amen and so listen that there's that struggle and without the Spirit of God uh, you can repent all you want but there's going to be that struggle you're still not going to have the power to overcome the flesh and the sin that says only be said. And remember, Paul said that we're running this race, and he says that, that we're to lay aside every sin and every weight that so easily besets us because the enemy is always trying to trip us up. But that battle over the flesh has to come into subjection to the Holy Spirit, and he has to, that flesh has to die. Uh, we all died at that cross. When we accepted Christ, we were crucified with him. But then on the third day, we were resurrected with him in the newness of life by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what raised Christ out of the grave. That was the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the power of God. And that's what raises us up out of death, out of darkness, out of defeat, out of despair, out of discouragement, and this, all the other things that the enemy, come on, God wants to raise us up by the power of his Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ wants to work in our life. Now, he says this in John. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. This means that every believer has the Holy Spirit. It is an inaccuracy to divide Christians among the Spirit-filled and the non-Spirit-filled. If a person is not filled with the Holy Spirit, they are not a Christian at all. Now, I believe that. I believe that. We, uh, uh, the baptism, uh, we didn't get saved. We couldn't get saved without the Spirit of God. Uh, he's the one that brought us to that point. And, and uh, uh, you know, in your walk with God, God, if you're hungry, if you're thirsting for God, if you want more of God, and you let God know these things, He will fill you. I... I think I've related this, but I'll relate it again. And I, No, I don't think I will. I think we're going to stop right there because here it is. It's 257. And I, I don't want to get into that. But we're going to pick back up on the Spirit of Christ, this, the Holy Spirit. But let me ask you, have you, how do I know that I had the Spirit? Ask these questions of yourself. Has the Spirit led you to Jesus? Has the Spirit put in you a desire to honor Jesus? Is the Spirit leading you to be more like Jesus? Is the Spirit at work in your heart? 
If you can answer those questions all yes, then yes, you have the Holy Spirit. Well, it's been good. God's Word is always precious to me, and I'm always delighted to teach it. And I do want to remind you that this material is available free of charge to you. Uh, if you would email me or at tlreynolds1950 at gmail.com or you can get on my Facebook page and my page or our church page, Present Truth Fellowship Church or Gleanings in the Word page. That's a new page I created this last week for this very teaching. And so if you get on there and you request this and I'll send it to you free of charge, no charge, and you can follow along with me. This is such a powerful study. This will revolutionize your life. I have very big confidence in this, that God can do something if you begin to honestly study this Word. And so uh, we encourage you to get that and uh, we just love you and praise and we pray God that God's blessings be upon you. Let us pray. Father, we're grateful today for what you've done, for the word you've spoken to us, Father. As always, you've been very kind to us, Father. Oh, we feel so undeserving so most of the time. But God, I just pray that your word begin to come alive, begin to bring conviction upon the hearts of every one of us, that we would begin to repent of those things that are not pleasing to you and that we would draw nigh unto you. You said if we draw nigh to you, you would draw nigh to us, Father. So we come to you as humble servants today, knowing that we need you more than ever. Lord, we give you praise, God. And if there's one person out there who needs to know you as Savior, Father, let them receive you. Let them confess their sins and let them ask you for forgiveness and let them receive your Son into their lives and let them be empowered and changed by the Spirit of you. Oh, Lord, we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, thank you for being with me, and we're looking forward to next week. I'll tell you, this, these, these things always excite me, and uh, I hope that if you don't have a church or you're not been in a church, find a church to go to. There's some great churches around, and I'm telling you, you need to be in the house of God. Well, God bless each and every one of you. We thank you for it all. Hallelujah.